Why are we still fighting for democracy in America? I thought that on the short list of things that all Americans agree on, it went democracy is good, dogs are basically people, and Cardi B and Offset know exactly what they're doing. Yet if we believe in democracy, government based on the will of the people where everyone's vote is equal, why are our institutions so anti-democratic? Turns out Republicans don't actually like democracy very much. And funny, they keep pointing to the founding fathers to explain why. I'm Francesca Fiorentini and we're looking at how our democratic system is currently set up to protect minority rule. That is, unless we fight for something different. Hey, if you haven't subscribed to AJ Plus yet, do it right now and turn on your notifications. It's so easy. After 2016, I don't trust polls or joy, which is why when I see multiple polls showing Joe Biden is beating Donald Trump and feel a bit of joy, I immediately take a cold shower and call a voter in Pennsylvania. Go f myself. Thank you. I feel human again. But what does seem to be true is that a record number of Americans are voting and voting early. Georgia set a record on day one of early voting. More than 22 and a half million Americans have already voted early. Historic voter turnout. In fact, one county in Texas had about the same amount of early voters as the whole state of Georgia on its first day. Yes, and Kanye will take credit for all of it. All that voting is running counter to Republican efforts to suppress voting, or as they call it, stopping voter fraud. Yeah, voter fraud, the chupacabra of the right, a blood-sucking demon few have seen, yet they swear exists. I sing him el chupacabra with the body of a snake and the head of a George Soros. What Republicans are actually doing with the help of conservative-leaning courts, including SCOTUS in their gutting of the Voting Rights Act, is making it harder to vote. They've eliminated polling locations, which has led to long lines, specifically in communities of color, purge names from voter rolls in places like Wisconsin and Georgia, added voter ID laws, and Texas will only have one ballot drop-off location per county, which means that in Houston, the nearly 5 million residents will have to share a single drop box. And I know, I know, every Everything's bigger in Texas, but that ballot box would have to be stupidly large, which coincidentally is the same size as the state's medium Coke. These efforts to prevent voters from exercising their democratic rights almost leads one to believe, and maybe this is just a theory, but it's almost like Republicans don't want all Americans to vote. Think about all the get out the vote campaigns we've seen. Democrats are always behind them, while Republicans are less interested in the vote and more interested in the get out part. In fact, Republicans are scared of what would happen to their chances of winning if all citizens voted, particularly the non-white citizens. I mean, just listen to Trump openly admit what would happen if Democrats got their wish to expand voting by mail. They had things, uh, levels of voting that if you ever agreed to it, you'd never have a Republican elected in this country again. Man, Trump has never met a quiet part he wouldn't say out loud. If we let people vote, they'll vote me out. If they get an education, they'll believe in climate change. If if we stop supporting Israel, then Jesus will never come back and force the Jews to choose between conversion or damnation. Which part is the secret? Multiple Republicans have echoed the president's words, but Kentucky Representative Thomas Massey had a particularly telling take on universal mail-in voting when he tweeted it would be the end of our republic as we know it. What does he mean? Why is it the end of America if more people can vote? Well, if you notice, Massey didn't say the end of our democracy. He called it a republic, a distinction conservatives have been recently bizarrely fixated on. In fact, they praise it as a system that's in direct opposition to democracy. We are a republic, not a democracy. And in a republic, you don't rule by uh, polls. You rule by the thought and the philosophy of those duly elected. We're not a democracy, we are a republic. If you are a direct democracy, it's mob rule. We are not a democracy. We are a constitutional republic. That is why we have um, uh, two ways, both from a democracy uh, voting and then from the, uh, uh, where we have the uh, electoral college. Damn, there are self owns and then there's Arizona Republican Paul Gosar. Talk about a flashback to being an undergrad struggling through section. Uh, well, the paradigm, um, 
uh, shift of the main person or character is um, such that the mm, syntax is a uh, yeah I skimmed it but let's unpack what these men are saying democracy is mob rule and America is ruled by the philosophy of those duly elected what's that philosophy exactly oligarchy because I'm pretty sure it's oligarchy what is a republic actually by definition, it's any government that isn't ruled by a monarch, but by elected representatives. Cool, that sounds like democracy. The key, however, is in implementation, how those representatives are elected and who they represent. That's where the right suddenly disagrees, and they keep pointing to the constitutional framers to back up the idea that undemocratic representation is okay. Because lo and behold, the founding fathers weren't all that concerned with democracy. To them, the people who deserved a say in government were the white men who owned property, not women or enslaved people or the indigenous whose land they built a country on. It's partly why, even though his brain did a factory settings hard reset midway through explaining it, that representative was right. The Senate and the Electoral College were created, in fact, to confine democratic rights to a powerful minority. The Senate is a completely unrepresentative body, as it gives a huge advantage to small population states. Two senators represent 39 million Californians, while two senators also represent 578,000 people in Wyoming. And that translates to less representation of cities and of people of color. It also means a person in California has less representation in Washington than the Wyoming sage grouse, or as it's commonly known, the Wyoming fuckboy turkey. Thirst trapping ass bird. How is that fair? Well, the Senate wasn't designed to be fair. Back in 1787, James Madison said that the Senate ought to be so constituted as to protect the minority of the opulent against the majority. In other words, protect the small amount of rich people from the large amount of hungry people. And they say the Founding Fathers didn't care about minorities. Then there's the Electoral College, the strangest American custom next to burning down an entire forest to find out it's a boy! The Electoral College was designed to overrepresent slaveholding states. Back then, the North had a population advantage over the South, so the idea of the popular vote was discarded. Instead, thanks to, again, an idea by the slaveholder James Madison, an Electoral College was created that would assign states electors based on their population. Enslaved people back then were counted as three-fifths of a person, so even though they couldn't vote, their numbers were used to boost the voting power of the plantation owners and the Electoral College swung in the South's favor. And today, the Electoral College forces candidates to pay more attention to swing states, which are often ones with a whiter population. But slavery no longer exists, and despite the right's best efforts, black people and women can vote. So why do we still have things like the Electoral College, which has handed Republicans two recent presidencies despite losing the popular vote? I'm answering my question. Why America holds on to these unrepresentative systems is even a question Fox News hosts are debating. Democrats say, wait a minute, this is a tyranny. We never get a voice. The Republicans, who are a minority of the voters, Why? are in it's fact dominating this democracy. It's a constitutional republic. Oh, yeah. Those rules about the government, they've never changed. They've been in place since the 1700s. This country has changed and we need to address it because right now we're allowing no, no, a minority you've to rule over the a majority. Stayed the same. This country has stayed the same. Name one thing that's different from the 1700s, my Afro-Latino co-anchor of a magic moving picture show. The truth is, Republicans are scared of losing. They know that they're demographically at a disadvantage. Whiter and older people tend to vote Republican, but the number of white Americans has declined in all 50 states since 2010. Meanwhile, young people and people of color tend to vote Democrat, with the fastest growing voter bloc being Asian Americans. So the Republicans' entire voting base is going the way of the dinosaur, and I, as an Asian American millennial, am the meteor. Incoming, bitches. That's why Republicans rely on voter suppression, or cheating, to keep young people and people of color from the polls. And when they still can't win, they start calling us a constitutional republic instead of a democracy, as author Astra Taylor says, a way of rationalizing the further entrenchment of minority rule. Republicans know that if actual representative democracy ever did emerge in the US, they might be equal. 
Rather than accept the idea that rich white men would be on equal footing to everyone else, they're attempting to turn back the clock to a time when they were at the top of the heap and no one had ever heard of a Filipino. And if they can't suppress the vote, Republicans make it extremely hard or impossible for ex-felons to vote. Or they deprive black people of power by gerrymandering along racial lines. Or better yet, they can always use the Supreme Court to swing the election in their favor. And speaking of the Supreme Court, notice that Judge Amy Coney Barrett calls herself an originalist. That's the same coded language as constitutional republic, which translates to ensuring a rich white male power structure. When you define yourself as an originalist, what does that mean? So originalism means that you treat the Constitution as law, and in interpreting that law, you interpret it in accord with the meaning that people would have understood it to have at the time that it was ratified. Yeah, ratified in 1788, back when we would salt our meats, live until the ripe age of 36, and you as a woman would have never been a judge. Man, being an originalist is like the conservative version of being a hipster. Yeah, I have the constitution on vinyl and like, the quality of the white supremacy is just superior. The question is, in the year 2020, when I could have sworn we were gonna have jetpacks, why are we still having to figure out what kind of government we want the United States to have? Do we want a truly representational republic? Or do we want to keep living inside some poorly written off-brand Hamilton fanfic? Drop a beat. A psh, a psh, a psh. <laughs> My name is Madison and I'm here to say, democracy takes white power away. Voting is the first step to throwing out that Republican fanfic. Making it easier to vote is the second. But the rest is going to require decades of work, reining in corporate money and politics, ending the Electoral College, and reforming the Senate. Things that aren't actually all that radical. We deserve a real democracy, and it's time to fight for one. Thanks for watching News Broke, and despite everything that we just laid out and how our democracy is very much a work in progress, I hope that you are still voting obviously, because um, it scares the powerful, and that's always fun to just freak them out. Let us know in the comments below what you've been doing beyond voting to get involved, because this is going to take all of us. And we'll see you next week.